So I'm going to go through and just kind of tell you what's going on in Lansing right now. Um, oh, okay. Julie just touched a little bit about the fiscal year 24 budget. Just want to highlight a few things on there and that will kind of give you an idea of what the landscape is in Lansing. So revenue sharing, you know, we talk about revenue sharing all the time, um, you know, and are very grateful for all the increases we get to our county revenue sharing line item. But that county revenue sharing line item is, is for your use for whatever your particular needs are in your county. So it's an unrestricted revenue source. And that means that what your priorities are, you can put that money toward. Um, when the governor did her budget recommendation for revenue sharing, it was a total of a 17% increase. And as it went through the legislature, the House passed it out with a 17% increase. So there was one-time funding for revenue sharing and ongoing funding for revenue sharing, one-time funding for public safety, which you'll see up there, and then um, uh, ongoing for public safety. It passed through the House that way, went over to the Senate, the Senate passed it out with just the increase in revenue sharing, so the one-time funding and the ongoing funding for revenue sharing, and they dropped the public safety piece. During negotiations in conference behind closed doors, they decided that they were just going to go with a 5% increase in revenue sharing and a 2% increase for public safety. Um, and then they passed the budget out that way. Now, I tell you that not, well, one, because I'm slightly frustrated and didn't really have that communication because that was made at, you know, the upper levels. Um, and two, because we really need you to help us advocate for the revenue sharing trust fund bills. And I'm going to talk about those here in just a second. But I wanted to highlight that for you and, and give you sort of the background on it. Um, you'll also see a ton of other wins on this slide for counties. You know, the child care funding reimbursement um, is increased to 75% for those community-based services. So that money was allocated in the budget. Julie mentioned the increase for essential local public health, which is fantastic. But there's a big number on here that I want you to pay attention to, and that's the $181.6 million for individual projects in individual areas across the state. And this is something that we don't typically see in your normal budget process. So this was money that was allocated for very specific projects in individual areas across the state. City of Lansing, Pontiac, you know, some for the counties. Um, and, it, and it was very individualized. And that's great for those communities that receive those, those dollars. But again, it's, it's sort of one-offs. But that's kind of how they did the budget this year. So it was, it was a little bit atypical. Um, but I got to say, overall, we were really quite happy with the amount of money that was being sent back out to locals to help you provide the services you provide. Oh, one, one thing I do want to mention there, and it's kind of right at the bottom, so don't, don't overlook that. The legislature allocated $30 million in incentive grants for counties to work with local units of government to implement this early voting. So that's going to be, you know, that nine days of early voting, and each individual township is going to really be struggling to staff that office and have it open all the time. So the legislature decided that they wanted counties to step up to the plate and really help them um, provide that nine days of early voting. All right, so let's talk about the legislative calendar, because again, this is atypical. Um, earlier this year, the legislature passed a bill that would move up the presidential primary to February of this year, making Michigan the fifth in the nation for presidential primaries. Um, but the way things work in Lansing is that the bill does not go into effect until 90 days after signee die. So signee die is that very last day of the legislative session in any given calendar year. Now, if the legislature votes, and in the House they voted for an immediate effect on that presidential primary date movement. But in the Senate, they did not get enough votes to make it an immediate to give it immediate effect. So what that means is you cannot have the presidential primary in February of next year unless the legislature adjourns sine die this year and has 90 days plus the 90 days early voting that they need to comply with in order to have that happen. So we anticipate, and hear rumors all the time, but we anticipate that the legislature is going to adjourn sine die by November 8th of this year. So that really condenses their fall legislative calendar 
um, and makes it a challenge to get all of our priorities done in that short amount of time. Um, and if you add to that, the election, now the House has a Democratic majority, but they only have, you know, really a cushion of two votes. So if the Democrats wanted to run things through and it wasn't necessarily supported on the other side of the aisle, they need those members in order to advance that legislation. Well, this year in November, we've got some mayoral elections where two of the Democrats are running for mayor. And if they're successful in their bid, and I, I hope they are for their sake, because that's what they want, but if they are successful, then that's gonna make it an even split in votes in the Michigan House until you can have a special election and then backfill those positions. So as far as legislative calendar goes, what that means is we're gonna try and get done as much as we can get done in October and the beginning of November, but then it might be a struggle to get things passed until they can actually fill the rest of those seats. So that still remains to be seen based on the election results. Okay, so let's talk about policy. Let's talk about what's going on out there in Lansing. We've talked in, at MAC ad nauseum about the Revenue Sharing Trust Fund. And what we're trying to do with the Revenue Sharing Trust Fund bills is carve out a percentage of the state sales tax and put that into a fund that the legislature then draws down from and appropriates out your revenue sharing payments every year. You're like, well, well what's the difference, right? Because our money's coming out of the general fund. What, why, why do we really need these bills? We need them because I told you when they went to conference at the end of this last budget cycle, they decided that they were gonna take money out of revenue sharing and allocate it to other things, other special projects or, or wherever their priorities were. If we have a dedicated revenue source that goes straight to this trust fund, then that's all that money can be spent on is revenue sharing. And it's not, we're not gonna run the risk of get, getting diverted in the you know, last minute during budget negotiations. In addition to that, this carve out as a percentage of the state sales tax is gonna allow for a natural growth in that dollar amount. State revenues have far exceeded what they've shared with local units of government. Our revenue sharing has not kept up with their growth in revenue, is what I'm saying. So as the sales tax goes up, the amount of money that would go into that revenue sharing trust fund would go up. If sales tax goes down, then you know, we might have a problem. And, you know, but, and there would be less money in there. But at least this builds in um, some security for those dollars and allows for a growth mechanism keeping our fingers crossed. Now this, these bills have been years of negotiations with the Michigan Municipal League, the Michigan Township Association, us, and the legislature and administration. Um, we, it passed out of the House Local Government Committee with a unanimous vote. Everyone on that committee, yes, recognizes that revenue sharing is extremely important to locals and we need to secure those funds. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. We're hoping that it gets across the finish line um, yet before they adjourn in November, um, but at least out of the House before the end of October. I will say this, once it gets over to the Senate, we're looking pretty good there too. Because we've had, you know, Senator Veronica Kleinfeld, former MAC board member and MAC board president, um, has her version of the bills, and Senator Jeremy Moss had bills. So we do have a significant amount of support once it gets over to the Senate. But I need you to talk to your legislators about it. Get it moving. Tell them how important it is for you to have that flexibility and that predictable revenue source. Okay, public safety trust fund bills, and, and Representative Rogers mentioned this a little bit earlier. This is something that was the idea of Mayor Duggan, who said we need to really address violent crime and really crack down on it. So he wants to take a percentage of the sales tax, put it in a public safety trust fund, sound familiar? put it in a public safety trust fund and then allocate that money out to those local units of government that are experiencing you know, violent crime. Um, the way the bills were written is the money would go to cities, villages, and townships, but it could pass through to the county if we had a contract with one of those municipalities that we provide to provide those services to them. Well, some of you were in my, you know, heard me talk about this a little bit earlier, not all of you contract, but you do provide those police services. You know, your counties provide specialty services out to the local municipalities, whether they be dive teams or detective services or, um, you know, 
forensics, whatever it may be. Um, and so we really think the county should have at least a portion of that revenue that is generated to help support the law enforcement at the county sheriff level. Um, in addition to that, and, and it's not, you know, I'll acknowledge you're still talking about jail population increasing and more work for your county prosecutor offices. So we're working on getting that done. Representative Rogers had an amendment. Um, they decided they did not want to adopt the amendment, but we're working on getting it on in um, on the House floor. All right, a couple other things, personal property tax reimbursement. Um, the legislature, jeez, uh, that was three years ago now, um, decided they were going to increase the small business exemption for personal property tax. What does this mean? It means that those b small businesses in your communities that have personal property up to $180,000 in true cash value don't have to pay taxes on that anymore. And that's great, I'm sure, for your businesses and for economic development, but it is, again, less revenue for the local units of government who rely on that revenue. So the, we have $75 million put away, we just need the reimbursement mechanism to do it. So those bills have finally passed out of committee and I expect them to get done before the end of November. All right, disabled veterans property tax exemption. Again, an issue that we've talked about a gazillion times. Um, the legislature back in 2014 uh, passed a law that said those that are 100% disabled are exempt from paying property taxes. That's great. We honor our veterans. We absolutely understand that. But what they didn't do was reimburse local units of government for that mandate. And so we're again working with the legislature to try and get bills passed that would give you that reimbursement mechanism. Um, the administration's not really fond of it. They, you know, it's going to be upwards of $100 million a year that they would have to reimburse local units. Um, so we're struggling a little bit with that. But at the same time, they're running policy bills that are going to kind of clean up the process. So for those of you who have heard from constituents, a surviving spouse perhaps, that you know they're having problems getting that exemption transferred over to them, that those pieces of legislation are now on their way to the governor to be signed. So we're cleaning some of, up, some of the policy up too. All right, this one's a new one, and we haven't talked about this at all. But Representative Brixey out of AM County has um, an idea where she wants those units of local government that are really struggling to build, to invest in some of their infrastructure, to have the tax base or the revenue necessary to complete those things. So it's called her Raise Up Local Grant Program. And what she wants to do is say those communities that are assessing a millage for roads, for unfunded accrued liabilities, for other types of infrastructure. Um, she wants to match the amount of money that you're raising so that it gives you the money that you need in order to make those infrastructure improvements or pay down some of those obligations. Um, it was supposed to be up for a hearing in the House Tax Policy Committee and they ran out of time. But there is significant talk about this program and what it might mean. The problem is, is that there's really no good funding source. So this would be dependent on an annual appropriation every year. But if this is something that interests you, I'd love to get your feedback and talk to you about it. Not sure how much it's gonna cost or how much they're gonna be able to allocate every year if it crosses the finish line, but it is something interesting that you might care about. All right, juvenile justice. If you're reading our legislative update, if you're listening to our podcasts, you have heard us talk about the changes to the JJ system multiple times. Um, the legislation is, it's a large package of bills, bipartisan, bicameral, um, legislation moving that is gonna solidify some of the policy issues we've been talking about. So it would solidify that increased reimbursement rate for juveniles just entering into the system to 75% for community-based services, not across the board. Um, it's gonna, you know, d implement more uh, screening tools, you know, sort of diversion. We don't necessarily want these kids locked up. We want them to get the help that they need. So there's gonna be more screening tools, more diversion. Um, it's gonna expand the Michigan Indigent Defense Commission to be able to represent juveniles, to apply to what, you know, to their cases. So they're gonna get additional help, additional, resources and we're going to have to have additional qualifications for those that are representing them. Again, you know, any changes, I'll remind you, if they do anything to the Michigan Internet Defense Commission requirements, 
that has to be paid for by the state. And each year they are allocating the money to cover those costs. It's cumbersome, I know, to the administrators in the office who have to apply for these grants every year, um, but the money is flowing from that commitment. Trial court funding, we're still sitting on it. Now you know we've been had that looming threat over our head for a long time now that we're not gonna be able to charge these fines and fees to those criminal defendants. Um, we've had extension after extension adopted in the legislature to allow us to continue to do that. We actually thought the Michigan Supreme Court was gonna issue a ruling saying yes or no. And basically what they said was, legislature, get back to work. Figure out how you're gonna fix this, this funding problem, how you're gonna fix these fines and fees. And we currently have a deadline of May of 2024 to get that done if they don't extend it again. Um, but that's where it currently stands. We really don't have any um, movement on that solution yet, but it's still on our radar screen. So let's talk renewable energy, because this one's making me pull my hair out. Um, so the governor has goals uh, of clean energy. The legislature is on board. They really want to see more reliance on renewable and less reliance on coal-fired plants. So the Senate right now is working on a package of bills that are setting those really aggressive goals of 100% renewable by 2040. Um, you know, all day long, you know, we don't really, MAG doesn't really have a position on moving in that direction, on being 100% reliable on renewables. But what we do care about is how they want to go about implementing that. So I'm going to talk about something that they're trying to preempt local units of government on, and that is siting for solar and wind facilities across the state. They're hearing from, I say they, the legislature is hearing from developers, hearing from utilities that they're going to have a really hard time meeting that, that goal of 100% renewable by 2040. And they're hearing a problem with local units of government changing the rules of the game, making it, too dif making it difficult to... Uh, build out, you know, wind turbine facilities, solar facilities across the state. And what they've decided to do, well, I can't say they've decided. We've seen many bill drafts where they're talking about taking that siting authority completely away from local units of government and giving it over to the Michigan Public Service Commission. That means you would have zero say of what goes into your, into your county. Um, so we're working with the bill sponsor to try and come up with a way that still gives the county a voice. If you've adopted a zoning ordinance and you're allowing for build out of renewable, then that is exactly what those developers should be following for permitting purposes for the build out. Um, you know, not sure if they're going to accept that or not. So right now we are fighting the total preemption issue on solar siting. Um, Stay tuned. The bills, like I said, have not been introduced yet, um, and we understand that they have their goals, but we also need to respect local zoning and the voice of local units of government and their, and their residents. Um, and I will say this, the Michigan Public Service Commission has never been in the land use business. Right? I mean, they want to talk about, they want to talk about rates, they want to talk about you know, energy generation and facilities and transmission, all of those things, but they've never been in the land use business. And so we're trying to keep those two issues separated. I'll, I'll go back. Aggregates, that's just another preemption issue that we had talked about previously. Um, you know, still haven't really seen any movement on it. Not sure where that's gonna go yet this legislative term, but that's again another preemption issue where they wanna see siting for aggregate mines taken out of the hands of locals and given to the state. Now, I say they, when I say they, it's not always just legislators who are doing it. There are industry folks who are pushing this too. And so, you know, some legislators are gonna listen to them, some are not, some are not, you know, they're not all on board with this. Um, so your voice matters. If you, wanna, if you wanna combat, you know, some of the industry desires to change things and take it out of local hands. So statewide septic code, I know another favorite in this crowd, you guys love this one. I know you hate it. Um, so Representative Phil Skaggs from Kent County, again, former county commissioner, has 4479, and that would um, create a statewide septic code. 
And what he wants to do is have those septic systems inspected every five years. And I, that's a tall, tall order for our members. We get that. We understand that your public health departments are really trying to figure out how they would make that timeline work. Um, so we've offered amendments to Representative Skaggs, um, and we want to see, you know, we get they want to deal with, you know, septic tanks that are not being inspected. They want to deal with the E. coli in our rivers and lakes and streams. They want to kind of clean up our, our groundwater and rivers and lakes and, and take care of this pollutant for those that are failing. But this goes a little bit too far and understand that it's really unworkable at this point. So, you know, Madeline from our office has been really digging in deep on this one um, and, and working with Representative Skaggs to try and make it somewhat more manageable, um, not just for compliance, but cost-wise and for your residents. I gotta hurry up, don't I? Yeah, okay. Um, so I will move on with that. Uh, but I don't think that that's gonna move this fall. I think the septic issue will be punted to next year. Um, binding arbitration, gotta say this, the legislature has moved um, a bill that expands binding arbitration to county corrections officers and now to um, university police staff. That I know is an issue that, you know, we've been opposed to the expansion to county corrections officers for a long time, but that is moving through the process. Past the House, past the Senate committee, it's now sitting on the Senate floor. One thing to keep your eye on is 4688, that's minimum staffing. And that would require staffing to be a, a required item for collective bargaining. And I've talked to, you know, several of our county commissioners out there who are saying, I can't even hire sheriff deputies, let alone comply with, you know, if I have to, if I have to bargain that and they want minimum staffing, how am I going to do that? Is that a breach of contract if we don't even have the staff? Or what does mandatory overtime look like? So you might want to weigh in on that one too. Stormwater management, a couple of bills out there to deal with that. You've got um, you have bills that would create water management districts, sort of by petition, allow for packets of storage, and deal with some of the flooding and protect some of your infrastructure um, across your county. That has had a couple of hearings in the House Committee but hasn't actually moved yet. The other piece is stormwater utility. That's getting ready to be dropped in in the Senate. Again, a reintroduction from previous sessions, and that would create a municipal department that would be able to manage stormwater better at the, at the local level and then have you know, rates that, that pay for it. So all of that is a ton of information, and there are hundreds more bills that we're watching and following for you. So I just want you to you know, be aware, we've got resources out in the back when you're first walking into the room. We've got some resources to talk about a few of the topics that I covered here today, so some policy briefs. But we also have our platforms out there. And we adopt our platforms tomorrow at our business meeting, tomorrow morning at the business meeting. Those platforms are written by county commissioners who participate on our internal committees. And that information is what we derive our positions from. So you come, you participate in our committees, we rewrite those platforms, that tells us that we can support this, oppose this, fix this, that type of thing. So your involvement is absolutely critical. Um, you know, we've got lots of information out there. Read our legislative updates, um, listen to our podcast, read our newsletters, call our office. We need you involved. We don't, t I tell you all of these things because I want you to take this information back to your, the rest of your county commissioners in your county. I want you to think about the things that are happening in Lansing and how they might affect the job that you do. And I also want you to help us advocate for you. So the more information we can give you, the more you have, the better. Because then when you're talking to your legislators, you can help us. And I went way over, so if you have questions, catch me later. Because I'm in trouble. I'm getting like the hook. So with that, thank you.